It is always the formless one who acts through its many forms of the mind and life and body. And each soul is only one of the stations from which it chooses to watch and receive and actuate its own play. Again, an image comes which helps to fully appreciate and give a concrete form to this truth. If you take a dark curtain, sheet of paper perhaps, put a bright light behind it and then punch many holes on this, innumerable little holes. Each hole will appear like a separate source of light, like a separate person, separate focal point of consciousness. But the reality behind the screen is it is all one light, one source. And although they appear different brightnesses, different angles in their play, they are all specialized focal points for the same one light. It is not this one light separately coming here and separately coming there. It is one light beaming out everywhere of which you are seeing only a special focus and a special aspect. And if now you think of this light as a dynamic light which is engaging, putting out signals, messages, in itself, it holds all the possibilities which it can play are now pouring out through these focal points and playing out here between each other. All that it already holds within it is only pushed out to manifest, become many in the play. <coughs> so the retaining of the body of human life or not is a circumstance of no essential importance because it's always the same formless one working out through many forms. So even if I disengage from my body, all the other bodies are, well, my own body, isn't it? I am still participating in the play through those forms. Here one gets a glimpse of how differently that consciousness sees our human life and our human issues. When we say that, where is the divine? How will the divine help? It's one of those questions you will find coming up very often in the human mind. When people will say, I am praying to God, will he listen to me? I have made a prayer, but maybe just in case, why don't you pray also? <laughs> you will often find people doing this when there is a sacred space. They will call up somebody who lives in the sacred place. You are closer to the deity, you pray for me. You offer this special puja, break a coconut, put a donation of 100 rupees on my behalf. And if you ask them, well, have you prayed? No, no, God won't listen to me. If you pray, God will listen to you somehow. And when you think about it, from a very human perspective, it sounded reasonable because you're at a distance. But when you think of it from this perspective, it's so silly. In the very moment that you're aware of a need, who is aware? The Divine Himself will of your need. Or put it another way, the Divine was already aware of your need long before you became aware of it. Not only anticipated the danger to your life and intervened before you even knew that there was a problem. And maybe solved the problem before you realized that the problem was there or has been solved. And so Mother makes this command. She says, most of the time we are so unconscious. The Divine is constantly, the Divine Grace is constantly intervening, protecting us and even preventing so many problems, we don't even know that we have been saved so many times. It's only once in a while when something actually ends up going wrong that you say, oh, I had an accident, what happened, the divine protection didn't work. But all the while that it was working and so many problems averted, we are not even conscious. So from the perspective of the divine, these kinds of human formations of our relationship with the divine are so silly so narrow, so limited, and so wrong. In the very moment that you call, that you aspire, that you ask, even before your mind has formulated the thought, the Divine Presence within you not only has known, not only has received, but has even responded. Because there is nothing other than that. 
And this is the reason why in practice, when people used to write to Sri Aurobindo and the mother, they would write a letter, they would post, wrap it up and go a certain distance in those days to post it, drop it in a post box, and then wait for so many days for the letter to reach physically in Pondicherry, and many more days for the response to come by another letter. But in practice they found, they would go, they would post the letter, they would come back home, and suddenly the problem has already changed. The fever has dropped, the difficulty has somehow been resolved, or some change has begun. So you have a few letters asking Sri Aurobindo or the mother, how is it that even before I have, the letter has reached you, I have received the help? And they cl clarify that it is not the physical letter which is important, it's your effort to formulate and put out. And often in the very act of writing, the formulation has taken place in consciousness and the message formed has reached and the response also put out. Mother described this very unusual experience during the Second World War when she said that because of the situation, they had to intervene actively. What it meant in practice was, she representing the manifesting aspect of the consciousness, in her, she says, as if a telephone exchange was put upon her. As if. So you have to understand what that means. A way of connecting to that space, plugging in into the war environment, in which all the links were held in her consciousness. And she said there would be constantly messages, calls for help coming, and to each there was instantly the response going out. A continuous exchange in consciousness, in thought, energy, emotion, even sometimes physically intervening. So we have heard from Pandiji, who was as mother's secretary, he would take to her some of the letters that came, some of the money orders of donation. During the war, the financial situation was so serious, mother herself would receive each donation and sign personally. Now you'd wonder why? What's the point? You know, somebody signs, it's received, the work is done. She wanted to make the physical connection to the person not only in receiving what came, but also to send from her consciousness the benediction when she signed. So during that time, Pandiji would take these letters and the money orders, and as she would be signing, she would suddenly pause and go into trance. And then coming out, she would continue. Sometimes she would make some comment, uh, just suggestive comment, oh, there was a special call from Greece or some other countries. And you would wonder if at the same time there is this whole interchange going on energetically, why the need to go into trance? And this is understood when you recognize that when a physical intervention was required, a part of her consciousness projecting a physical help and in that moment, the physical consciousness here would automatically go into trance. At other levels of the help going out in the energy and in the mind consciousness, it didn't need that because those layers are more plastic. But when there is a projection from the physical consciousness to make a physical intervention, this part would become as if in a state of trance or partial trance. So these are... Um, for her consciousness living in this, they were all equally her own focal points of consciousness. And to each, depending on how she plugged into them, there would be more or less engagement. And when the whole need is no more required, there can be a withdrawal from that identification. Now who is going through this identification? Something of the surface personality itself. At the level of the pure consciousness of the cosmos, that connection was always there. It is in the layers of this surface mind, life and body that there can be an increased, intensified concentration or identification as needed or withdrawn. This was the way in which they helped the sadhana of the disciples. 
when taking responsibility for a disciple, it meant a part of her consciousness would identify and hold the person in her. her. Now, it doesn't mean that the others were not held. They were in the cosmic consciousness all equal. So, a few indications of this will help us to understand that relationship. In a letter to Dilip Kumar Roy, who was somehow there was an unusual connection, you will find the longest letters and some of the most numerous are to Dilip Kumar Roy, and he was from Sri Aurobindo. And he would often go into these periods of depression and confusion and Sri Aurobindo would uh, assuage him almost like a little child. And in one of the letters Sri Aurobindo writes, Long before we met physically and knew you by name, we had known of you and were following your progress. Now that gives you a glimpse of how that consciousness works. In the cosmic consciousness, again, go on. so in that cosmic consciousness, where everything is already in, the awareness can still narrow focus upon some. How would it know them? Not by name, because the focus is not on the body form and the sensory experience. It would know by consciousness. Now what that means, some of you have experienced, occasionally it happens, you remember somebody, you feel them as if in thought or energy and then the phone rings and they call. Or you feel them energetically connected, you recognize from the quality of the energy, ah, so and so, and then the email pops up. Or the letter comes. It can take many physical forms. Nowadays physical letters are not so common. But in the old days it was, you felt them and then the postman would come and it was their letter. What are you feeling? It's not the name, it's not the physical appearance, but the energetic quality of the person. So when you reach out to feel a person in your energetic consciousness, what do you feel? Their energy. When you reach out to feel them in the mental consciousness, what do you feel? Their mind. When you reach out in the pure essential self, what do you feel? Their soul. Okay, so in the cosmic consciousness, in the first glimpse, you feel the quality of the soul consciousness. And in some of them, there is a special relationship. Ah, this is a known person. Now the details of the relationship are not important. It is this. No name again required. You see? You have the familiarity of the soul in the way the soul knows, soul, essentially, ah yes. And then into it the mental component can come by identifying there you feel, ah, this is the person with whom these experiences or these lives were worked upon. Something of that content comes forward. Or at that point the mind may be slightly different in quality, so you still have a trace, but not too many details. And then the, you can connect energetically. Now this is the condition of his emotions. The person is right now going through some difficulty. There's a disturbed energy, disturbed pattern. And if at that point you wish to help, you bring into that disturbance the peace. And the person immediately feels a relief. Now in none of this have you engaged in the form and name of the body. And yet in their consciousness they feel these people and assist and help. There's another interesting letter of Sri Aurobindo where he explains how mother was working closely with a doctor in France. Later on, when in the newspapers or journals they read the description of one doctor, Kue, they recognized, ah, this was the person she had been working on. You see how it works? The consciousness of that person is known, the nature of the work through that person is being done, is known. When the text comes through a magazine, the name tells you nothing, but when, you dis when there is a description of the person, his words, his photograph, the nature of his work, immediately there is this familiarity of consciousness. Ah, 
it's the same consciousness. Oh, this is, they call him Dr. Kue. Aha, you just learned something interesting. <laughs> but it didn't matter if you knew the name or not. The work was being done. What was he doing incidentally? He was the person who brought or popularized the principle of healing through faith. So you can look him up. It became famous later on with a particular form of the formula. In English, it would go something like this. If you want to get, let's say, better in health, and before a mirror, and you look at your image, and you tell yourself, day by day, as I watch, I am growing more and more healthy. And you repeat that to yourself as a mantra, as an affirmation. Or if it's something specific, a person has some problem, this is getting better, this is being healed. You affirm the positive and repeat, visualizing, seeing yourself in the image. And through that he had extraordinary cures, miraculous cures. But through him, this affirmation of self-healing through faith was being put out in that particular space. How many more people similarly became conscious in, became instruments not necessarily conscious of the source of the help it doesn't matter because in the con cosmic consciousness they're all yours and you do not care whether they recognize whether they acknowledge whether people accept or not it doesn't matter this is what what it is the work is done and it's over so in mother's consciousness because that was the part of Sri Aurobindo's consciousness that was reaching out to take charge of the sadhana. She held each disciple as if herself. Now let's understand this a little more. Depending on the degree of identification, you feel the other person's mind and thoughts within your consciousness. Their life energies and their emotions and disturbances in yourself. And if you go a little further, even their physical health and condition, the body state, as if in yourself. Now when you are identifying on those levels, that reflects in your own consciousness, in your mind, in your energies, in your body. Okay? So to the extent that she would choose to identify, that person's state would reflect in her, and she could equally in identification imprint her consciousness into them. A two-way connection. And the person may have no idea at all. The person will be busy living his ordinary life, thinking, worrying, oh, what is happening? I have a problem. Where is mother? She is not helping me. But all the time, she is holding all this like a child in her arms. And literally, from within, gently exercising a support to change, to awaken, to grow, whatever it is she has to do. And the person is utterly unconscious. And in one example, which was narrated to me by one of her attendants, Gautam Chawala, he's passed away now. He said he was sitting next to the mother in the playground, and the mother was furiously scratching her arm. And obviously he was worried, he was concerned, and then she said to him, so and so, a person in the ashram, was indulging in an act of falsehood. You see, physically it registered in her body as this itching, because she had connected to that person in a consciousness, even physical. And it reflected in her body instantly. She has made comment of how in her body she was receiving this intense pain, because of the falsehood of humanity. And she said, I'm not worried about these things, it is the falsehood of humanity which is suffocating. So, it's a question of choice, to what degree she would identify, and to what extent she would take the responsibility. And in the earlier years of the ashram, the identification was more complete. Literally, she would be doing the sadhana within each person. They had to do nothing except remain open to her. And she did it all. And so we had very rapid progress. Later on, when there were many more who came, there was the mix of the children and other families, the same level of identification became impractical. And so she withdrew from that degree, instead put a general force pushing. 
and anybody who chooses consciously to open to that would feel the pressure of her consciousness pushing them, molding, shaping and assisting in the sadhana. But it needed that initial effort to make that contact. And she makes that comment and she, she says wryly, she says that now you have to make a little effort, but well, uh, that's the way it is. And pointing to this, to show you how one can consciousness and from there in diff to whatever degree identify with all the bodies as oneself uh, or any part, any collective consciousness as oneself. It is in this sense that we have to understand when it is said that the, the Divine takes the burden of human suffering. There is this famous image of Shiva. One of his names, one of his aspects, one of his functions in the universe is Neela Kantha. Neela is blue, Kantha is throat, the blue throated. It's one of his functions. And it's described in this way in the story deeply symbolic as the churning of the ocean takes place which is the evolutionary churning the ocean being the universal consciousness there are one by one many gifts which emerge which are of course evolutionary powers emerging and then before the nectar of immortality comes there is the release of the poison and the poison is so intense and this is coming out from it is so intense that it is overwhelming the world with its falsehood. And at that point, the world cannot support it. People would die, everything would end. So the Lord himself has to take the poison and drink it. But of course, it's not something which he can drink fully. He holds it in his throat. So the suggestion is this. The poison is contained it is there still, but its impact is withdrawn from the world. The burden of the suffering, the burden of the pain, the burden of that is taken by the Divine Himself. And His throat becomes blue. So the serpent comes to cover it and to cool it. So deep symbolism there, but the point being, the Divine takes up this burden of the suffering. And when we say, I am suffering, to the extent that we claim the suffering as mine, you prevent the Divine from taking it from you. You're carrying your luggage, if the Divine lifts it up, you snatch it back and say, it's my luggage, it's my suffering, it's my problem, I suffer. You bring it and make it yours. To the extent that you allow and let go and say, Here, this is the burden of the difficulty, you take it. It takes the burden from you. It is there, but you'll find it will no more affect you. You'll no more feel it as a suffering. There's a stress, a pressure, something which demands your full attention and energy, effort, but you don't suffer anymore. The burden of the suffering is taken. At best, superficially, there's a bit of a tension or a disturbance. That is possible because it's there right now. The error is for us to claim and seize and then make it ours and then it's really our own creation. So in the cosmic consciousness the divine takes that burden. You have the image in the Buddhist tradition of the Buddha as he is about to merge into the Nirvana he turns around and looks at the world in a glance and it is the glance of the deepest most profound compassion because it sees the suffering of the world and it chooses not to immerse until the entire world is liberated. Now it's a, a very profound suggestion. He's about to merge and he turns back. Half turning. It's not the whole turning. He doesn't stop from merging. It's on the borderline as he merges that a part turns back to embrace the world and you see, it is from a poise of consciousness bordering the absolute, free of space and time. So the impact of that influence is as if for the ages, an assistance, a suffering, of the, in the suffering, the gaze of compassion which lifts and elevates that suffering. So this is the aspect of the Buddha which is considered to be the most compassionate and most worshipped 
most beloved to the disciples. But the idea you can see is a poise of the divine as he turns to take the burden of the world's suffering. In the cosmic consciousness, you can feel what it would be like. The divine holds it all. Everything is his and all is stations from which it chooses to watch and receive and actuate its own play. When a special focus is made, a special concentration, as the mother did here for the disciples that they carried, <coughs> the physical location of the disciple was irrelevant, as you can see in the cosmic consciousness. Where you are, you are equally in the self. So the physical location was irrelevant for this purpose. At best it is important because a physical space may hold a certain concentration of the vibration and so being in that space is an aid but for them to act upon you or to support you in the sadhana it makes no difference where you are and in this sense the mother held the whole community in herself and as we saw in her body she identified with each one and took the burden of their difficulty also on herself this relationship was experienced on the other side from the individual side of the sadhaka as the mother being present with him constantly, obviously in a form. And so this is described by Sri Aurobindo in a letter where he says that every time that the mother accepts somebody as a disciple, an emanation of her is present with you constantly. So the person writes to Sri Aurobindo to ask for clarification. Oh, that means a part of her is with me, a part of her with somebody else. It's like she is split up. But you see, this is the mind thinking that one divine needs to cut up into many pieces to be with us. But when you see it from the cosmic consciousness perspective, it is she wholly with you, wholly with another, wholly with another. So Sri Aurobindo explains in the letter, he says, no, it is not a part of her. It is the whole of her consciousness with you. But the aspect that is most relevant for you. Now you see that difference is again important. The whole of the divine with you, putting forward the aspect which is for you, the way you would relate or you need to relate to the divine. So for somebody the aspect is one of friend. For somebody it is the aspect of the teacher. For somebody it is the aspect of parent. And you know, we have all these different relationships with the Divine, the Beloved, the Child, etc. But whichever is the relationship that to me is the most natural way in which I can open to the Divine, that's the aspect put forward for me by the wholeness of the Divine as it is represented to me in the emanation. So Sri Aurobindo explains it is the whole of the Mother in that aspect. And that emanation is with you constantly even when you are not conscious. And so he clarifies in one of the letters, he says, the help is always with you, but the call makes the help effective. Why? Because in the act of calling, you remember her and you open to her. Otherwise, what are you doing with your problem? Oh, my problem, I'm fighting, I'm struggling. All my energy is turned to the problem and with my narrow limited capacity. I don't even for a moment stop and say, Mother, help me. So in that brief moment when I turn, I'm connecting and opening to her and immediately the help can pour through. Otherwise, the help is there, but my agitation as if screens, covers or limits to make less effective. So the phrasing is very uh, precise. He says, the help is always there. The call or the prayer makes it effective. And so we can pause at this point on this larger idea. The next paragraph <coughs> brings us into a deeper understanding of what is it into which we are merging. What is this cosmic consciousness? That into which we merge ourselves in the cosmic consciousness is Satchidananda. And the aspect of the oneness 
and the multiplicity of the working is described there, which of course makes us understand this relationship better. How the divine can be equally with each one in each thing entirely in an aspect at the same time in all space and time. So that oneness and the multiplicity being simultaneous in the Satchidananda that he describes and subsequently in the next two paragraphs he discusses how we can the finer gradations of our relationship with the divine and the sense of multiplicity and how we make the transition from this multiplicity to the oneness. But this point is a good place to pause because it helps us to know the perspective of the divine in relation to us and how and understanding a deeper feel of that in our deeper parts of the soul perhaps can help us erase the wrong notions of the relationship. And when that is erased, from our heart, our opening is more spontaneous, more easy and also more complete. In one incident which I will end with, when uh, one of the disciples here passed away, a few years later, the mother commented to one of the family members that he has now taken birth, but not here. It was in another city. Now she knew in her cosmic consciousness the status of the soul. Then later she commented, he has now entered my physical aura. Now her physical aura extended about 10 kilometers around Pondicherry, a radius of 10 kilometers. And that was holding a population of perhaps 300,000, 400,000, something like that. So in that cosmic consciousness, with this particular focus of attention in the physical vibration, she is conscious that a soul has entered that space. And you can see what that means. Here on her frontal consciousness, she is interacting with X, who is busy complaining about, oh, you know, so and so, he did refused to give me an extra cup of milk and so and so was nasty to me. Mother, you did not smile to me, you smiled to someone else, you gave him four flowers, you gave me three flowers. Can you see how petty that whole thing is? <laughs> and yet people filling her with that and she had to pacify them and say, yes, yes, don't worry. And in her consciousness, this is all happening. And each person and each thing that is happening, to whatever extent she needs to know, she can bring forward into this individual consciousness, or it's always there in her cosmic consciousness to be worked upon consciously, with full attention on each person. And that's how she mentions when somebody, Paul Richard, tried to take birth in one of the children in Oroville, she blocked from entering. Now, you must understand what that means. In that cosmic consciousness, she is aware of each thing and is able to intervene to prevent somebody or to help somebody to take birth or to assist in any situation right then. Udar narrated a story once where he said he was going somewhere for some work and the train had a head-on collision with another train. The other train fell over. His train somehow got thrown off from the tracks and fell on the side of the tracks. A few injured but nothing damaged. So instead of continuing, he just came back. And he said he went to the mother and before he could uh, say anything, mother said, I was not sure in which bogey you were in, so I had to save the whole train. <laughs> it's amazing that you realize in that consciousness she is tracking each person and aware when there is a danger able to intervene. It's the reason why on a very material level in the ashram activities, there was strict instructions from the mother that everybody who went out of the ashram's physical space had to inform. They gave a list. These are the names going for a picnic. We are going to leave at this time. We will come back by this time. Now you may think, oh, it's just procedure. It's just bureaucracy. We have to inform. And right now it has become that, you know, you inform the department, okay. But behind that was this deeper truth. Mother wished to know herself personally. 
and she didn't care how much time it took she gave it that time and attention because there was a protection which went and held within this immediate physical space where she held this very densified protection it did not need that kind of an active intervention but outside that on a physical level the protection was given in this way for this purpose so some stories which we can more deeply appreciate when we see from that perspective of the cosmic consciousness and the question is why is there a difference in space time and uh, distance proximity closeness in the essential consciousness can you have can you not have them all at the same time yes in fact the completion of this experience is when you have it all at the same time because that's how the divine experience is it now in the cosmic consciousness disengage from the physical vital and mental grades in the cosmic consciousness which is you will say one soul of the whole cosmos i am equally in all things at the same time when i am in that poise in that relationship everything is within me and i am in everything first as first level of experience as a second level of experience i can say although i am in everything certain things are more aligned to this than to that so the distinctions can come there so the alignment of or the closeness of consciousness is felt in some variation of type in some variation of quality in some very sense of physical distance but it's like if i feel my body which is closer my left arm or my right arm they're equally close right so the galaxy on the other end of the universe and the galaxy on the other end they're both equally in me and equally close and yet between these two arms i can feel a relationship so it's almost like a secondary or phenomenal experience so he uses this phrase here um, retaining or non retaining of the human life is a circumstance of no essential importance so in the essentiality that does not matter but it is there also in the layers of the experience but secondarily or tertiarily when in this consciousness i also identify which will be the discussion in the next few chapters i also experience the oneness of the mental consciousness so now i enter not just from the cosmic consciousness of the self i enter into the mind and in the mind i experience universality my mind and others minds are part of one universal mind and yet within that there are differences in quality a mind viewing this way a mind viewing that way then i further enter the life force with one universal life energy taking special focal points in different bodies where am i i am in each of them they are all in me but this is different from that in quality and in separation and then finally in the physical consciousness my body is part of one continuum of physical universe and i may experience the sense of distances between these but i am equally in all of them so the sense of distance and separation is there superficially as an experience but not essential to my presence to my location so there is a process by which we reengage reembrace the universe all the way down to matter from such a cosmic consciousness and then we can hold the oneness and the multiplicity equally that would lead the nature of the completion of this which he is leading us to so in the cosmic consciousness in the mother's consciousness all of us are like little centers and as we remember here her as we read sri aurobindo he fills you with the knowledge with the experience with the support and the understanding irrespective of where you are irrespective of what is your current capacity the lift is given the light fills you and the experience is awakened i remember another i'll end with this example this young girl she was 15 perhaps had a darshan of shri rubindo she went back because she was too young she went back and she had shri rubindo's life divine 
So she went up on her terrace, opened the book and started reading. And she felt as if Sri Aurobindo was reciting to her line by line, word by word. And as she read, the whole understanding of it became so simple, so obvious, direct. Now people who are professors at the age of 60 struggling to understand the text. And here's a 15 year old who finds it as if Sri Aurobindo is teaching her and leading her through the whole thing. The difference is this, you open yourself and he gives it to you. You don't even need to be making a desperate call, please, please, nothing of that. You just simply open and he's there and she gives, fills you. And that's how we have to read this text and receive the help. We'll close with Om. <coughs> We'll continue this next Friday. Oh.